everybody this uh, dreary and rainy morning but it's uh, it's a good rain and we didn't get the rain that they they um, forecasted so we need to be thankful for being spared all the flooding and that sort of thing so because there's, there's so many others that are so uh, devastated and the Florida people and the and the Carolinas were just um, they just got a, the brunt of it. So, but anyway, it's nice to be here this morning. Nice to see everybody, all your your, your smiling faces. And um, we have some people out this morning due to power outages and and whatever. So, it we just pray that they will be their lights will be back on soon. I know that's a that's a hard thing to deal with, and um, and hope that we'll see them next Sunday and that they'll have a good week. We'll continue on with the call to worship. The promises of the world turn to ashes and dust, but the promises of God last forever. The Holy One calls to us, come. And we'll continue on with the opening prayers uh, done in unison. Lord, throughout the world today, Christians are sharing in the sacrament of Holy Communion. We come together with a bountiful table set in the midst of struggle and strife. Help us to receive the elements of bread and wine for the nourishment of our souls and for the strengthening of our witness to your love for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now I'll turn it over to Liz. Thank you, Diana. Oh, uh, yeah, we really miss everybody that's not here today. Uh, we are a, a close family, and it, it just makes your week go smoother when everyone is here. Huh. We are the Monacan Trail Cooperative Parish. I have a story that some years ago, there was a small tribe of Native Americans living in the state of Mississippi. They lived along the banks of a very swift and dangerous river. The current was so strong that if someone accidentally fell in, they would likely be swept away so their death downstream. One day, this tribe was attacked by another tribe. They found themselves literally with their backs up against the treacherous river. They were greatly outnumbered. Their only chance for escape was to cross the current, which would mean death for the children, the elderly, the weak, the injured, and maybe uh, even the strong. The leaders of the tribe devised a plan. The logical thing, the sensible thing, the expedient thing. The sensible thing was to leave the weak behind. They were going to be killed anyway. Why risk losing the strong in a futile effort to save the weak? This was the rational answer but they couldn't do it. Instead, they chose to be extravagant 
in their generosity. And they decided that those who were strong would pick up the weaker ones and put them on their shoulders. So the little ones, the old ones, the ones that were ill or injured would be carried across on the backs of the other. With great fear, they waded out into the rapid waters of the river and they were met with a great surprise. To their astonishment, they decided with the extra weight on their shoulders, it enabled them to keep their footing through the treacherous current and to make it safely to the other side. Their extravagant generosity saved them. What they did was not the sensible thing or the reasonable thing, but it was the right thing to do. The point is, if you, who are strong and comfortable and well-fed, will reach out in generosity to help someone in need, you will be surprised to discover that the life you save may be even your own. Our scripture reading comes from uh, Philippians uh, chapter 2, starting with verse 1. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and symphony, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but be humility, regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interest, but to the interest of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be explored, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, be humble himself, and become obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. The word of God for the people of God. Well, good morning. <laughs> And welcome to worship, and, and a warm welcome to our internet worshipers who are joining us uh, this month here at uh, Batesville Church, and, and a reminder to be sure to come back next week because our, our homecoming service will be our virtual uh, service for next Sunday. So, the faithful few, we might say, <laughs> are, are the adventurous few, maybe? So I, I just came from Trinity Church. Uh, there's no electricity on at Trinity Church. So, uh, and I reminded them, I said, well, you know what? When the church was built in 1892, there wasn't any electricity then either. Uh, but there was power in the church. Uh, the church power isn't dependent upon our electric companies, thank God. <laughs> so uh, so we, we worship together with the power of the Holy Spirit whether we have lights or not, or, or whether we, we have our screens or not, or yes, our modern uh, electric pianos require uh, electricity also, uh, but we can sing a cappella. So uh, uh, worship is a little different, but it's, it's, it's good. So it's good to have all of you here today. So our second reading today is from uh, Paul's letter to Timothy, and I'll be reading uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dear son, Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith which first lived in your grandmother Lois, 
and in your mother Eunice. And I am persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame, because I know whom I have believed, and I'm convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. What you heard from me keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for these quiet moments in the rain. And we give you thanks for for the gift of your Son and and for these words that you have given us today. And and may it be your words that retain with us uh, as we leave this space later on. We ask this in your name. Amen. So Joanne and I were in the Ruckersville Lowe's this uh, past week. We, we went in over on the lumber section, which is on the right side of that building. I know some of them, they reversed that. But in Ruckersville, the lumber is on the right. And, and the, the garden center is on the left. And of course, you know, just inside from the garden center is the big seasonal area that each uh, Lowe's has. And, and even as far away as, as the lumber section, we could look down that aisle and off in the distance I saw a forest of artificial Christmas trees. <laughs> Decorated, complete with lights. And, and I thought, really? Christmas is three months away yet. But I got to hand it to Lowe's. They know what they're doing because they got me thinking about Christmas. And and thinking about those Christmas seasons as a young boy uh, growing up on Gillespie Avenue in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, When I was a young boy, we always had Christmas in the basement. Uh, Dad had finished off the basement with uh, knotty pine, real knotty pine uh, paneling. Uh, When they originally built the house, he had a chimney put in, and so in the process of finishing the basement, uh, he had the masons come in and create a fireplace, uh, a nice wide hearth of soapstone on top. It was just uh, the right height for a young boy to sit on and warm my backside in front of the fireplace. I bet you that brings back some memories for you also. You know, one memory always seems to spark other memories. It's almost like, you know, dominoes falling over against each other. So I also remember in the late spring when my mother would do her spring cleaning of the house. And and by that time, it had been, you know, probably two months since the last time we had a fire in the fireplace. So part of her spring cleaning was to clean the ashes out of the fireplace. 
And I remember this uh, one occasion where um, she, she took the, the shovel that was in the fireplace set and shoveled out the ashes. And, and of course, here's another memory. You remember those brown, heavy, doubled up grocery bags that we used to come home from the grocery store? So she took one of those and dumped all the old ashes in it and set it out in the driveway. Well, it wasn't long after that that the phone rang. And mother answered the phone and some, the voice said, Mrs. Worley, do you know there's something burning in your driveway? <laughs> Even though it had been two months since the last time that there was a fire built in this fireplace, there was still enough life in some small ember that was insulated by all the ashes that once mother stirred them up and let that ember have a, a new breath of air, it burst into flames and, and, or it came back to life and, and caused the bag to burst into flames. Now, thank the good Lord that it happened in the driveway and that mother didn't set it on the end of the hearth where there were drapes on the wall right there. And I'm sure it won't surprise any of you to know that my dad went out and found a, an old metal bucket for us to put the ashes in from then on. So I think maybe the Apostle Paul would see the, this memory of mine as a, a good metaphor for Timothy. Because it sounds like maybe that the fire in Timothy has cooled a bit, uh, maybe because of the challenges and the persecution of the early church. Timothy is discouraged by the fact that Paul is imprisoned again, uh, but, but Paul still encourages him to fan the flame, to rekindle that fire, to stir up the ashes so that air can get to that ember that he knows is still in Timothy and it can come to life again. Within the context of this letter that Paul writes to Timothy, the, these were not easy times for Christians at all, or nor for the early church. Uh, Paul is in prison in Rome for the second time, and with the expectation that his only uh, way of freedom will be by death. In fact, he was beheaded within a year of writing this letter uh, to Timothy. Most, if not all, of the apostles uh, were martyred. It wasn't until the middle of the 4th century when uh, Constantine the Great embraced Christianity as the official religion of the Roman Empire that the church could emerge from, say, the basements that they had been meeting in or the caves or whatever other secret places where they were conducting worship. But even with those challenges and with persecution, as we read in the book of Acts, we see that the church still continued to grow in leaps and bounds in those days uh, because they had a message of love and salvation that the world yearned to hear. No government could snuff out the fire that told of the gift of Jesus Christ who had conquered death and brought the promise of eternal life to everyone. Now, if you notice in this letter to Timothy, Paul doesn't appeal to Timothy to start any new fires. Instead, he asks him to, flame, to fan into flame the fire that is already in him. I, I wonder in the face of decline of our churches. And, and it's not just a United Methodist thing. All churches are declining. I wonder if we haven't allowed our flame to be snuffed out a little bit by ashes, like that little ember that mother found in the fireplace. Maybe some ashes that also come from extreme political infighting that we can find 24-7 on the TV, just turn it on any time of the day. Infighting both from Washington politics, 
but also regrettably from church politics. I bumped into a fairly old article from the Washington Post this past week. I think it was from six years ago. It was written by Eric Erickson. So I want to share what Eric had to say. Christians looking for a strong politician to protect the church instead of the strongest man who conquered death is a terrible thing to see. Many Christian leaders are engaged in a kind of fusion belief, trying to blend patriotism with Christianity. They seemingly argue that if the nation falls, the church falls. And for the church to rise, the country must rise. But Christ has already risen. So, there, so the true church is in no danger of falling. The gates of hell shall not prevail. You see, the world will always be in tension with the church because the church is not of this world. The church is of the kingdom of God. The world would have us pursue wealth at, at all costs, but the kingdom would have us give to those who have nothing. The world looks to those who rise up in power above all others. The kingdom welcomes those who are the least of all. The world would incite punishment and retribution for those who transgress us. But the kingdom would have us show mercy. The world would have us destroy and eliminate enemies. The kingdom blesses the peacemaker. A central theme that we find in Timothy is Paul's encouragement to endure those challenges of a Christian life and to endure the persecution of the church by the world. He tells him in his words to, to guard that good deposit the good deposit, the gift of the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. I believe the church is called to rekindle that flame of old, to stir up the ashes, to, to reveal that ember, and to fan it back into flame. The flame that was written, lit by Jesus Christ when he emerged victorious from the grave, victorious over death, and became the gift of salvation and eternal life for all of us. A gift that we remember today in the sacrament of the Lord's table. And it's in that gift, it's in that flame, that we as a church and as Christians are called to carry out into the world. Paul reminds us, for the Spirit of God gave, for the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Gives us power even in the absence of electricity. And may God and to God be the glory. Amen. So I invite you to retrieve your communion liturgy from the insert in your bulletin. Christ Jesus invites to his table all who love God and who repent of their sins and wish to be in a relationship with God. And so let us confess our sins to one another. Merciful Lord, you know that we are stubborn and willful. We believe that we know the right way to do everything and to heal all the troubles of the world. Our efforts fall far short of the goal of reconciliation. Forgive us our stubbornness and arrogance. Heal our wounded souls and restore hope and compassion to our relationship with you and with each other. Lift us up and cause us to serve you by serving others in this world.
God's love and restoring mercy are poured out for all. Receive these blessings, for we are loved by God and granted forgiveness and mercy. Glory Glory to God. God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You have made from one every nation and people to live on all the face of the earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. He commissioned us to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth and to make disciples of all nations. And today, his family in all the world is joined at his holy table. And on the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread and gave thanks to you. And he broke the bread. And he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, when the dinner was over, he took the cup and gave thanks. And gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and many for the forgiveness of sin. As often as you do these things, do them in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts through Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a living and holy sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us, as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, and on these gifts of bread and a cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. Renew our communion with your church throughout the world and strengthen it in every nation and among every people to witness faithfully in your name. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at the heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, All honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. So I invite you to reveal the bread in your cup. The body of Christ given for you. Now the juice the blood of Christ shed for you. Let 
Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this meal that you have provided us today. We give you thanks for the the presence of the, the saints of the past, the present, and future of, of, of our brothers and sisters in Christ worldwide, and most especially the presences of your Son, Jesus Christ, in the meal. We give you thanks for his sacrifice on the cross and the gift of salvation and eternal life. In your name we pray. Amen. So here are these words of benediction. Fan the ember. Fan the flame. And carry it out into the world. For a world that needs that light. That needs that good news of salvation through Jesus Christ. We ask this in your name. Amen. Go forth in peace.